Live from the American Riviera in Santa Barbara, California, please welcome the host of Ken Boxer Live, Mr. Ken Boxer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to another edition of Ken Boxer Live. I'm your host, Ken Boxer. You know him as the adorable, lovable Theodore Beaver Cleaver from the iconic television show, Leave it to Beaver. Well, tonight, joining us this half hour is the very talented actor, Jerry Mathers. What you may not know, however, is that Jerry's been acting since the age of two. In fact, Jerry Mathers has worked with some of the heavyweights in the industry, Alfred Hitchcock, Alan Ladd, Bob Hope, and Frank Sinatra, just to name a few. And we've snagged Jerry from his very busy schedule just to be with us tonight on Ken Boxer Live. So let's meet and welcome the multi-talented actor and one of America's most adored pop culture figures, Jerry Mathers. Welcome to our show. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you for being here. I've been trying to get you on the show for a while and we finally connected. I'm so happy you're here. It's a good Well, thank you for inviting me. I've, you know, the question I've, I've often wondered to ask is, when you were doing the show, did you know at the time, even though you're a young child, how old were you when you started? Uh, about six when we actually did the pilot and by the time we really started filming the Leave it to Beaver, I was almost a little over seven. Did you know then, at that time, that there was something special? No, no, not at all. I mean, I I worked since I was two years old, so I've I've done movies. I didn't do any any other series, but I had done a lot of movies and things like that. So, in fact, every year it was um, a question whether we would come back for the next year because you had to be picked up. So you'd do 39 shows, and then we'd go to New York and meet um, all the press, and then we'd go to Chicago to meet the ad people, then we'd come back and take about five to six weeks off, and if we got picked up, then we'd start again. So we did that for six years because um, that was the length of the contracts at those times. So that's why there's 39 for six years, and then it was off the air. Not off the air, but we didn't film any new ones. But you've got to realize that now you, know, you look back and you, you see the show. I mean, I grew up with that. My friends grew up with it. No, I grew up with it. You grew up with it. So, when, I mean, you're almost like that, the part was real for us. We know your bedroom. We know the stairs that go up to the bedroom. We know Wally. We know the whole cast. And but you the, don't really know me. You don't because, really know you. Because I'm a different person than the beaver. The beaver is a, a character that I played, and I've played a lot of characters. I've played in my life good characters, bad characters. The beaver is my most famous character, and it's a great one to be in that position because it's a wonderful character. It's an American boy growing up in the 50s. And, you know, and if you look at it, it's really a lot of the things that went on in the 50s. It was a very innocent time. If you look at today's world and the 50s, people at that time thought, you know, we just come out of a war, a world war, and they were very, very happy, and it was almost a joyous time. You know, you think about it, I just was watching and read that the Beatles Mm -hmm. had their 50th anniversary and Ed Sullivan. So you were still seven years ahead of that when you started. And yet it's still in that same era of the happy times. It was was a time of innocence. The the 50s and the 60s, we'd we'd come out of World War II. The soldiers pretty much got back in in the early 40s. But, you know, it took them a while to reintegrate. And the country was really running well at that time, and everybody was fairly happy. It was, it was a nice place to live. Did you ever think, though, that um, you would just get the command that you do for all these years? I mentioned in the intro, you're an icon. Well, and, and I don't know, if, I don't don't know think, about that. Well, you're very modest to not say so, but isn't he, ladies and gentlemen, isn't he an icon? <laughs> I mean, you are. You absolutely no, are. No, we, in fact, every year we, we filmed Leave it to Beaver for six years, and every year at the end, from the first year to the last year, we never knew whether we'd come back the next year. Really? You know, because it was a very, very competitive market. But after six years, um, in Hollywood, that's as long as you can sign the contract. And so after six years, we knew we wouldn't come back because by that time, everyone would want a lot more money and a lot more sure. benefits. And so we knew at, at, at the end of six years that it was pretty much over. Well, was it hard to learn your lines at such a young age? No, because I've been on live TV since I was two years old. So my very first job at two years old um, 
was walking into a bar room with cowboys fighting. I'd walk right through them and they'd break chairs over each other and flip all over the place. One of them would pick me up, set me on the bar. I would pound on the bar with my fist. I had on uh, cowboy boots, a 10 gallon hat, six gun and diapers and that's all. And I'd say, I'm the toughest hombre in these parts and you better have my brand. And Ed Wynn, who did the Ed Wynn show at that time, which was a comedy review, would then go into a commercial for pet milk, which was baby formula. So that's the first thing I ever did on television. And once I did that right, all the shows at that time were not videotaped, they were all live. So once as a child you did one show right, you worked all the time because they couldn't take a chance. Because if you walked out there and panicked, forgot your lines, you were in front of a live audience. If that scared you, the other actors had to work around you because if you didn't say your line, uh, there was no way somebody could come out and prop you. Well, how much time did you have to learn a line? Maybe for the show. three or four days. Well, Leave It to Beaver. Uh -huh. Leave It to Beaver, we got the script on Sunday night. We went in and read it on Monday. Um, Tuesday, we went in and we staged the entire show like you do a play where they'd say, okay, on this line, move. If there were any complicated um, plots, like things, uh, gadgets, or things that we had to deal with, they would be there. And that was it. On, the, on Wednesday, we started shooting at 8 o'clock and shot for the next three days. So it took us a week to do a show, two days of rehearsal and three days of shooting. And how long did it take you to come up with the character? Well, the character was developed. I, it's nothing that I really came up with. I mean, the, the two writers had uh, 14 kids between them, Joe Conley and Bob Mosier. So they knew how kids talked. They knew how kids were. So it wasn't like I went in and just talked. No, but wait a second. Wait, wait, Those were all lines that were written. But wait, who actually goes to the dinner table with a suit and tie like Ward did? Actually, actually, Joe Conley and Bob Mosier every night would go to, this, the, to dinner with a, with a tie on. <laughs> really? Both the writers. At that time, there, there was a, um, a, a percentage of people that were very much like that. A man would come home. He'd been at the office all day. He didn't change because he didn't really want to get another shirt dirty. So he would go to the table at that time with his suit on, just as he'd come from the office. What's the most, Jerry, what's the most difficult part of knowing that, you know, as you left the show, mm -hmm. uh, to integrate back into, I mean, you went to high school. Well, that was a choice, though. See, I didn't want to continue. In fact, the, the, they had another series developed, and they wanted me as soon as Leave It to Beaver uh, quit to go on with another one, but it was my freshman year in high school. My dad was fully employed. He retired as a superintendent of LA City Schools, but at that time he was a vice principal. And he came to me and my mom too, and they said, do you want to go on and do another series? And I said, no, I want to go to high school and I want to play football. And so for the next four years, and it wasn't that I didn't want to work, because if people called during the summer, then I would go and do whatever shows. So you'll see me in a very few things um, but yes, it was a, a, a choice made by me that I didn't want to continue. I want to continue with that line of questioning. Okay. But before we continue that, I want to go to a clip so people okay. can see some of your early acting okay. and leave it to Beaver. Okay. Okay, let's watch Jerry Mathers. Hey, Mom, how come we're having ice cream? Your father got it. Because the Beaver stayed home all day by himself and he didn't make a fuss about it. Oh. <laughs> That's why we're having ice cream. <laughs> yes, Beaver, I thought you had a very good attitude. A lot of boys your age would have been resentful about it. No, Dad, I wasn't anything about it. We called you about 4 o'clock, but you didn't answer. Well, I guess I wasn't in the house then. Were you out in the backyard? Yeah, I guess I could have been out in the backyard. Couldn't I, Wally? Yeah, yeah, I guess you could have been. Well, Beaver, tomorrow you have a whole day to do anything you want. What are your plans? Well, I might go to the movies. We're well, going to the movies, huh? Fine. Yeah, I might go to the movies and win a bicycle, and I kind of feel lucky. <laughs> win a bicycle at the movies? Yeah, they raffle them off. <laughs> what makes you so sure you're going to win one? Well, I just have a feeling. Uh, Mom, could we be excused? Certainly. Jerry Mathers, ladies and gentlemen, we've got him here in our studio. Jerry. Right before that clip, I was asking about integrating back, essentially, mm -hmm. 
into uh, high school and things. Right. Was it difficult? I mean, were you, did they call you by your real name? Did they call you the thief? What, and what was it like? Were you, were you bullied in school? No, I was on the football team. So <laughs> I was on the freshman football team and the JV football team. So I started with the team and the school I went to. Uh, my dad had been a coach at a private school. It was Notre Dame High School. And so I had gone there when I was like three and four years old before I uh, started leaving to Beaver. So it was always my dream to go there. Um, it was an all boys school. And um, if you were on the football team, you had a lot of very big friends. So no one gave you any trouble. Was high school a good time for you? Very good. And, and as I said, it wasn't that I didn't want to work. And I did work during the summers. Mm -hmm. But the school said, if you want to come here, you can't go out and do TV shows or movies. And that was just a choice I made because I wanted to be with kids. As I say, I had a private tutor, which is probably the best education in the world. It's the education of the kings and queens of Europe. I was one-on-one -on -one with a teacher from the LA Unified School District um, for my entire elementary school years. So I got a great education, but I wanted to be with other kids and, mm -hmm. and socialize. And so that's what I did. Well, what's the pluses and minuses of being associated with this character? Theodore Cleaver. Well, oh, once the show ended, what was the pluses and minuses for you? Well, I, I was able to put myself through college. I was able to buy my first house. I mean, I, I was a, a wealthy person from what I had made myself. It wasn't inherited. It was what I had done as a child. So it's been a boon to me all my life. Of, I've gotten a lot of other work as an actor because of it. I'm here today. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Leave it to Beaver. Who knows where I'd be? I just can't even imagine what it would be like to leave a show like that and then make your, to just leave it and then stay out of show business for a while. Well, I didn't stay out. As I say, I worked during the summers. Um, in fact, during the summers I used to go, I had great jobs because of Leave it to Beaver. My summer job, I was a cowboy at a place like Knott's Berry Farm, but they were in um, North Carolina. And so I would go out and um, rob banks at this thing. And as you came out, you'd shoot. And I had a, a wonderful time. So it, it, there were always things that came from Leave it to Beaver that I did um, because it was such a good show. But well, what about the negative side? That's what I wanted to get to. What um, the negative having? Was there any, has there been? I haven't found it yet. If it comes, I'll come back and tell you. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Now, is it true, true mm -hmm. or false, is it true that uh, you had a band in high school? I did. Beaver and the Trappers. We played all the, in fact, we recorded for Atlantic <laughs> Records. And where did that go? Um, basically, it was number one in Hawaii and Alaska. And what I, what the, the reason for that was, is that during the summers, then I would go play all the amusement parks in the Midwest and East Coast. And that was my summer job. And that's how I bought my first car. Did you get to wisely, because you hear about, you know, you, the kids in, um, motion pictures and television are successful, they lose all their money. You said you were able to buy a house, but were you able to invest wisely? Um, yes. Uh, under, the, under the Coogan laws, a certain amount is put away. But the problem is, and I won't tell you which ones, but some of my contemporaries were not only supporting their own family, and the, neither one of the parents worked, but a couple of them were actually supporting extended families, like aunts and uncles. And those poor children were told, you know, if you don't work this week, this whole family doesn't eat. Now, my dad was fully employed, so, you know, it was nice to be able to have Leave it to Beaver, but it wasn't anything that my family really needed, and that I didn't have that kind of pressure put on me. Now, I had been told that there was over, like, 5,000 kids trying for this Beaver. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, was there ever a time in which, after you got the part, mm -hmm. you met any of those other People, well, yes, because... Or they later became famous on another show. That I, just, that, that I don't know, but I know that some of them that were on the original interview, what they did when they say 5,000, um, there were 5,000 people on the interview, but it was for all the parts. It just wasn't for the beaver. So they wanted, you know, they wanted a person for Eddie Haskell. They wanted Lumpy. They wanted, of course, Wally and the beaver. So, you know, and actually Leave it to Beaver was a very, very long interview because we kept going back. Probably probably four, maybe six, eight weeks, we'd go like twice a week and they'd line you up with different people and they'd, you'd have read a few lines. But I had just joined the Cub Scouts and I had my very, very first meeting. And so um, my mom said, oh, by the way, Jerry, I'm going to pick you up after school and then we're going to go back to that interview. And I said, well, I can't go. 
And my mom kind of said, what do you mean you can't go? I said, well, I have a Cub Scout meeting tomorrow. <laughs> and she said, well, you know what? Your Cub Scout meeting is until about a half hour or 45 minutes after. So we can go there and come back because this won't be like the 5,000 people. They're down to like the last five or six. And I said, well, okay, because I'm the kind of person that likes to be on time. So I went, and of course, they started taking everybody else. And I was the very last one in. And I was getting very antsy. And when I walked in, the, Joe Conley and Bob Mosher, the producer, said, you know, Jerry, you seem a, a little agitated or nervous today. Is there something wrong? And I said, yes, I'm going to be late for my Cub Scout meeting. Can I leave? And they said yes. And so I walked right in and right out. And my mom said, Jerry, what happened in there? How come you came out so quick? And I said, well, I told them I had a Cub Scout meeting, and they said I could go. My mom said, that probably wasn't the best thing to tell them because <laughs> we've been on this interview for quite a few weeks, and now they don't think you want to work. And they called that night and said I had the job as the beaver because they'd rather have a little boy that wanted to be a Cub Scout than an actor. And we're so glad they chose you, well, too. That's how I got the job. Wonderful story. Yeah. <laughs> you have an, a clip of you with Frank Sinatra. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was this was actually before Leave It to Beaver. I did, you know, I, I worked with Hitchcock. I did two movies with Bob Hope. I worked with Alan Ladd. So I was a, a working actor in a lot of shows that you wouldn't know because they were all live and there's not only not any record of them. But I worked all the time before Leave It to Beaver. Well, let's watch this clip. It's Sounds a brief good. Clip. Okay, let's watch. Hi. How's the battle going? Not so good. I've seen you before. Are you a doctor? Nope. My name's Frank. What's yours? Arnold Gordon Malty, Jr. My folks don't call me Jr. They call me Gordy. Okay, Gordy. Say, the doctors here at the hospital tell me you're a pretty good soldier yourself. The Indians are going to wipe out the stagecoach this time. See? Mm-hmm. Doesn't look very good, does it? Mm -mm. But I think I came just in time. Got some reinforcements. Gee, thanks. This is a battlefield, make-believe and real. The real battle is the one Gordy Noldy is fighting with tuberculosis. Welcome back. Jerry Mathers is our guest. Jerry, it was rumored, and I know you've, you've talked about this on other shows, that you had died. And that thing, like, Eddie Haskell was a, a porn star. Well, I mean, Eddie all... Haskell being a porn star, John Holmes, who actually was a porn star, actually told people he was on Leave it to Beaver <laughs> That's how and, and played Eddie Haskell. Okay, and, so and Ken actually... Osmond, who was a police officer at the time, actually sued him and won the case that he had uh, defamed his name. Oh, I, I never knew that. Yeah. I never knew that. So you actually could pinpoint where that rumor starts. That so how was... did the rumor start you, that you were dead? Um, you know, that I really don't know. Um, I got up one morning and a lot of people were, had been calling, started calling, and it said that uh, an actor had been killed in Vietnam, and it was Jerry <clears throat> Mathers of Leave it to Beaver. At that time, I had friends that were reporters, and they said that people used to scan casualty lists just to see if they could find any name that for some reason rang a bell, and maybe there was a person with a, a similar or the same name. I was in the Air Force, because after I finished high school, I enlisted in the Air Force and spent six years in the Air Force and then the Air National Guard. So I was in the service, and people knew that. It wasn't anything I hid. So probably someone saw the same name or a similar name and said, oh, I know he's in the service. It must be him. Interesting. People ever come up to you and say, uh, wait a second, I thought you were dead? Actually, not so much fans, because they pretty much knew it, but people that I'd gone to high school with, they would do that. They because they shocked. Yeah, because they had actually known me, and they would, they would see me in the Los Angeles area, even like five, six years later sometimes, and they'd say, well, you know, you're not dead, are you? And I'd say, no. <laughs> Let's talk now about you were on Broadway. You were on, in Hairspray. Hairspray. Um, what was that like for you to go from, you know, the, the small screen television, and I know you were motion pictures as well, and now you're going to be live in front of an audience. What was that like for you? Well, I've done a lot of plays. Uh, I've, I've toured one play for, that was written by Schiller and Weisskopf, who were Norman Lear's head writers for 18 months. So that was something that I was very, very familiar with working on the stage. But, yeah, but going to Broadway, Broadway is, is something Broadway. that I never thought I would be able to do. 
And if you ever told me I was going to be on Broadway, I would have told you and you gave me the categories. I would never say I was going to be in a musical and singing and dancing. But <laughs> Why? Why? Well, because it's not anything that I've ever trained for. I've never trained to be a dancer. A dancer on Broadway is usually somebody who from usually elementary school or right into high school has been trained to be a dancer and singer. And so when the opportunity came up, um, I knew I'd have to train myself. So I spent about um, 15 weeks singing and actually um, uh, learning all the dances. My wife helped me at my, uh, we were, going together at the time, but um, now we're married, and she helped me Your with a lot. Your beautiful wife. My beautiful say. wife, absolutely. But she helped me a lot with it, because there were a lot of dance steps. And it was, um, I trained actually for about uh, 18 weeks to be able to do it before I even went back to New York. And my fans were so supportive. Hairspray at that time was almost ready to close. The night I started, it went to a full house. Um, the entire time I was there, which was about three and a half months, um, they, we did standing room only business. So my fans really supported me, and I always thanked them for it. But because of that, it made it very easy because suddenly I knew that I was doing it right, and people wouldn't have come back if I'd have gotten terrible reviews or you know not been good on it. They they would have said, oh well, you know he's a nice guy, but he just can't do Broadway. But not only did I do Broadway, but I did Broadway very well. Well, what are you doing? What are you being offered now? Type of you know, are you turning things down. Yeah, you, because every, what people, what actors are doing now, like me, who are uh, known names, are reality shows, and I don't want to have to jump off a an 80-foot diving board or you all the other things that but that's but that's what that's what they're picking actors to do now especially people like me who are a name because if you're gonna watch one of those shows if you see a name you know that may be one you turn in to watch me do whatever crazy thing they might want me to do oh, so Jerry you know what I'd love to see you that's do? what I'm afraid of yes. <laughs> I would love to see you and Tony Dow and Ken Osmond in a home for two yeah. weeks. <laughs> well, actually, we're that. very good friends. That, that would be pretty easy. Tony and, and Ken and I are very, very good friends. So that, that, wouldn't be, that, that would actually be a blessing. But, you know, when you, when you talk about the things that you do on a reality show, and they're not reality shows. I mean, it says reality, but they pretty much know in a lot of ways who's going to win, who's not, mm -hmm. what's going to happen. So it's just nothing I'm interested in. And the nice part is I've reached a point in my career when I don't have to take jobs like that. Well, what jobs would you take? What, what, kind well, of, I, what I, haven't you done that you would love to do? You know what? If you'd have said that a few years ago, I would have said Broadway. Now, I, I'm, I have diabetes, and so what I do is I go all over the country and speak about diabetes because it's it, epidemic proportions. A lot of people have it, and it's something that I know. Um, I was uh, diabetic. I am now pre-diabetic. Now, mine was all weight-related, and there are a lot of people like me that if they just took off a little weight, and if they don't, Sooner or later, they'll be on first pills and then uh, injecting themselves with insulin. So I feel that I can use my celebrity to help other people uh, on something that I've done. That's wonderful. In fact, you told me before the show how that all came about. One moment, you know, you thought everything was fine and you went to see the doctor. Yeah, I, I have a very good friend that's a doctor and it's a personal friend and she comes to a lot of family events and she kept telling me, oh, okay, Jerry, come on in for a physical because I put on the weight uh, over about three years and it was a lot of weight. It was about 45, 50 pounds heavier than I am right now. And I kept saying, I feel good. I'll see you when I'm sick. And she kept, she knew that I couldn't put on that much weight and be healthy, but she also knew me. So she said, you know what? For Christmas, I'm going to give you a free physical. How could I turn that down? I, right. I went back about you know, three weeks later, and she said, how would you like to see your kids graduate from high school? I said, sure. She said, get married, have grandchildren, all those things. I said, that's what I'm looking forward to as a father. She said, you'll be dead in three to five years because your blood sugars are out of control. You have raging diabetes. I had absolutely what I knew of as no symptoms. So I said to myself, I, life is too good. I took off the weight, and I'm now pre-diabetic. Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. Have, have you met with a lot of people who um, went to the doctor and have thanked you for well, yeah, a lot of people. That. A lot of people just don't really understand even what diabetes is. If, if you're overweight, 30, 40 pounds, it's very, very likely that your body just can't supply enough insulin, and that's what basically diabetes is. And are you, 
Is this an, a full-time position for you to go It's out? not full-time, but I, I go all over, the, all over the country. In fact, what I do, I say it's kind of like fishing. I go, I talk about Leave it to Beaver, I talk about working with Bob Hope, Belford Hitchcock, Frank Sinatra, and then I just, at the end, maybe the last 15 minutes, start talking about my life now and diabetes, and it just kind of flows into it, and people don't even really realize that they're learning a lot of propaganda about how to help themselves. I'm glad you're doing this work. It's very helpful. I, I wanted to play a name game with you. Okay. First thing that comes into your mind. Okay. I'll rattle off a few people. Okay. Barbara Billingsley. Very, mind. very nice lady, a, a socialite, uh, a huge um, giving person. She literally gave away, she was married to uh, a doctor and they were very, very wealthy and she literally gave away hundreds of thousands of dollars to different charities. So, and she was as nice as June Cleaver in a, in a different way, um, but just as nice as June Cleaver. She treated you like a mother? No. no. I mean, I knew I had a mother. She would be like your favorite teacher. I went there every day. She would help me, you know, if I had trouble with the line or whatever. But no, she was, I knew I had my mother. And she was, as I say, more like a favorite teacher. How about Hugh Beaumont? Hugh Beaumont was actually a Methodist minister. He came back from really? World War II, went to a theological school. And when he graduated, he asked for a very, very poor congregation because he wasn't married. And of course, when a, a pastor asked for it, he gave, got the very poorest. And suddenly he got married and started having kids. And he couldn't support them with the congregation that he was with. And so he started taking jobs as act, in acting because he could work during the week and it wasn't a steady job. And so that's why he actually became an actor. But his um, famous character was a detective named uh, Sam Spade, I believe. But anyway, it was a detective that always had a bottle of bourbon, smoked cigarettes. To get a confession, he'd take you and pound you up against the wall. <laughs> and it was nothing like Hugh Beaumont. And I think when he got the character of Ward on Leave it to Beaver, it was a character, I think, in a lot of the bedroom scenes when he's talking to the beaver, you can see that minister coming out. Yeah. Jerry, my name game has to stop and the show has to stop. It went too quickly. Uh, I have all the answers. Maybe I'll come back. <laughs> I hope so. Sounds Maybe. Good. You have to come back. Well, thank you. All right. Well, thank you. Appreciate your being here. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Well, thank you. Well, that's it for another edition of Ken Boxer Live. Now, be sure to tune in for some of our upcoming shows, which will include figure skater Ty Babylonia, actors Alan Thicke, Lost in Space star Billy Moomy, and actress Mariel Hemingway. These are some shows that I know you just won't want to miss. Also remember to catch us on the web at KenBoxerLive.com. Okay, so for my guest Jerry Mathers, and for my director Nick Ferretti, and my entire production crew, I'm Ken Boxer saying we'll see you next week on Ken Boxer Live. Good night, everybody. From the American Riviera in Santa Barbara, California, please welcome the host of Ken Boxer Live, Mr. Ken Boxer. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Thank you for being here. Hello again, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Ken Boxer Live. I'm your host, Ken Boxer. We have a very, very special guest joining us this half hour. Tonight, making her very first guest appearance on our show, is the very talented, award-winning KEYT news anchor, Sharin Rajay. Sharin not only co-anchors KEYT's morning show called This Morning, but she also produces many of the daily stories for the KEYT newscast. Many of us have enjoyed watching Sharin and have wondered, who is Sharin Rajay? And where did she come from? It's almost as if she just appeared one day <laughs> and captured the hearts of so many viewers. Well, tonight, we have Sharin here live in our studio. So let's now meet and get to know the very lovely, very talented, 
award-winning, mind you, KEYT news anchor, Sharin Roger. Welcome to... Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks. It's I'm so, so nice thrilled to, to be you. here. You've been so gracious ever since I first met you, so I am so honored to be on your show. Well, I'm not so used fun. to being on this side of the interview. Know, so. Is it uncomfortable <laughs> for you? You know, it's, it's different. It's different. Normally, I have questions prepared to ask you, but uh, but I'm ready. Oh, you're ready? So, okay, I'm going to yeah. dish them out. Okay, I mentioned that all of a sudden you just seem to just pop out of nowhere and <laughs> take in the hearts of everybody. Thank you. Where did you come from? What's your background? Where did it all begin? Um, well, I'm from Los Angeles, and so I was uh, so fortunate to get this opportunity to be in Santa Barbara here. But if we go back a little bit. Um, I started working at CNN Los Angeles. I got an opportunity to work um, in the LA Bureau at CNN behind the scenes. So I was working behind the camera, working in production, working to help produce several shows from Larry King Live to Showbiz Tonight to Headline News to working on the assignment desk. And I think that's where I learned the inner workings of a newsroom. I, it was, you know, working with some of the best talent in the industry, people that I admired. Um, so that's kind of where I learned the background of things. So you paid your dues. So I paid my dues. Oh yeah, three and a half years. I did everything they wanted me to do and I kind of worked my way up. Um, and they were very supportive. My CNN family, the, some who I'm very close to still, were very supportive of what I wanted to do. So from time to time they would let me kind of sit in, let me shoot some things to kind of get me prepared. Um, but I knew that I needed to get some on-camera experience. So as I was kind of in the industry working at CNN, I met some folks that worked for Persian television. And uh, they suggested, well, why don't you come work with us and maybe shoot some of our uh, junkets and entertainment, and entertainment news um, in the American market, but it would be in Farsi. So I went to the studios in Calabasas and I wanted to see what they were all about and they did a camera test. Um, and they said, you know what? Why don't you just host your own show? And, um, but how long did it take to get to that point once you got to... To the Persian say, television? Um, exactly. I would say pretty quickly. So I think once they kind of saw me, we did the interview and we worked together for maybe a few months. Um, they said, why don't you just host your own show? Would you be interested in doing something like that? And to be honest, um, the show would have been in Farsi, you know, satellite, so international and domestic. And Farsi is my first language. I'm Iranian, Persian. And, but I speak what I call Finglish. So I mix my English and my Farsi all the time. So I, I kind of, I went home to my mom and I said, how am I supposed to do this? You know, they, they've made me this offer to host this show. And she said, hey, listen, it's your first language. It'll come to you. I think you should do it. So I accepted the position and um, three and a half years there alongside CNN. So I was kind of juggling both because uh, it was only a once a week show. I would write my own scripts. I would basically produce the show myself and go gather American entertainment news, but in Farsi. So that's kind of where I got familiarity with the camera. But if somebody were to ask you today, how do you get into the business? What right. do you usually tell people? Okay, so I would definitely say internships. Um, and internships definitely just pave the way for you, get your foot in the door. So I think a lot of the young people that are uh, aspiring to be journalists or in this field, I say try to just get your foot into the door somewhere. I worked for C uh, NBC as an internship there, and so that kind of helped me build some contacts. So I would say internships okay, are the best now, way. We jumped into um, your starting at CNN, right? but let's go a little bit back even further. Okay. What were you doing in high school? <laughs> what, kind of, what were you doing? Oh, in what, high school? Yeah, pre-college days. What were you thinking about? Oh, that's interesting. Um, so I went to Arcadia High School. Uh, it's a city close to Pasadena. I don't know if you're familiar with it in the Los Angeles area. And, you know, growing up, I had aspirations to be in broadcasting, but I wasn't sure. I knew it was a very competitive market. Um, I didn't know if there was stability there or not. So um, I, had, I had a creative side to me. And so I was thinking, okay, if it's not going to be broadcasting, then maybe some kind of PR or publicity or something where I'm communicating with people out in the field. I wasn't the person that wanted to sit behind the desk from nine to five. I knew that. Um, and I felt that I had good communication skills, so something maybe with marketing or advertising. So I kind of explored different avenues. Um, well, I've been told, though, maybe it started then you have a great personality and you have a funny personality. Oh, You're always <laughs> telling jokes and, yeah. and the like. I heard, tell me if this is true or not, uh -oh. in high school mm -hmm. that um, 
you were in some auxiliary program. <laughs> where did you find you that? Were, you consumed <laughs> vodka instead of water. What was that? Is that where all the partying oh began? Oh my gosh, that is a funny story. <laughs> I have no idea who told you that, but that was really funny. Uh, so yes, I was part of the color guard in high school, and Arcadia High School had a very competitive color guard. You know, this like the flag team and the drinking the, vodka would be very. No, colorful. let me tell you that story. Let me tell you that story. So. Part of the color guard and the marching band, and so we had, it was almost very military-esque. We had rehearsals, and I would spin sabers, and I would spin uh, rifles, you know, wooden rifles, and we'd have competitions. And so one late night practice, um, we would have practice, I don't know, from like 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. at night, and it's very hardcore. And I would fill my water bottles up with water and I'd put them in the freezer so that they would kind of get really cold so that I can enjoy them, you know, when it's time to drink, when it's, um, you know, during the rehearsal. Well, my mom had put vodka in, <laughs> in a water bottle, I don't uh -huh. know why, um, in the freezer. So I, when I went to go grab for practice, I grabbed a water bottle thinking it's water, but it was vodka. <laughs> so... I went to practice and, you know, it's the, my instructor was really hard on us. And so we only had water breaks that were literally like 30 seconds. So I had my water ready and we're running and we're sweating and we're working. And then he goes, 30 second water break right now. So everyone runs to their water <laughs> bottles. I grab my water bottle. We have been running and going for a long time. And I take a huge like chug, 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 right. chug, chug. And it's like burning, 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 <laughs> burning, burning. And I, I could not believe I probably... I probably took in at least four to five shots of vodka, you know, knowing that this was not water, but I didn't know what to do, it's, who to tell. Well, you know, it's funny oh, thing is, it's, it's, usually, <laughs> it's usually children who are changing the, the vodka right? and the water, interchanging right. them when their parents are oh away. Oh my gosh, I was dying. So I had to tell my instructor that I have just taken five <laughs> shots of vodka. And uh, because story. I was throwing rifles in the air and, and I was feeling my head spin. And so my instructor got such a kick out of it that he was just dying of laughter and made me go through the routine anyway. Well, from there, mm -hmm. that moment, okay, you're, you're going from high school to CNN. You brought college. with you. College. We're going to college. Mm -hmm. You're going to college. But I'm skipping very jumping leaps here. Right. You received, ladies and gentlemen in our audience, this mm -hmm. is the Golden Mike Award. They don't just hand this out. And congratulations on getting this. Congrat really, seriously. <laughs> seriously. They don't just hand these out. You brought with you the clip I of did. your work that you received this award. Yeah, you, you know, uh, just recently received this golden mic, so it was uh, such an honor to be recognized. And um, this was for one of the news reports that I um, produced and wrote and inter did interviews for, for KUIT. Um, it was a really tough story to tell because it was very sensitive. Um, it was a woman that I had met who opened up to me and shared her story about losing her brother um, in a very horrific way uh, about 35 years ago. And so she was talking to me about her struggle and how she's been going to the trial proceedings uh, for the person who murdered her brother, um, making sure she does not get parole. Um, and how hard that was for her as a 14-year-old growing up and having to do this till, you know, she's an adult now. And so I said, hey, would you want to sit down and, and just kind of take a look back, you know, 35 years later? And she agreed. And um, I submitted this piece to um, the TV and Radio Academy, and they, they chose it as uh, a recipient of the right. mic. Well, yeah. let's watch. Let's watch Shireen Roger. <laughs> A few weeks before Christmas in December of 1978, little Javier, who had been playing with a friend at the family store, was nowhere to be found. Just feet away, a woman then in her 20s named Julia Diaz had an evil plan that would forever change a community. We knew a lot of people, so it wasn't his nature to just take off with somebody. So I just thought, okay, we're going to find him and that's it. This is the marketplace on Haley Street on Santa Barbara's east side, where little seven-year-old Javier used to love to play. Yolanda's family owned this market some 30 years ago, and just around the corner in this apartment complex is where Julia Diaz lured her victim. Julia had him in her room. She strangled him. She beat him over the head with a hammer. And then... While he was still alive, stuffed him into garbage bags. 
Um, it's believed that she purchased the garbage bags from my parents' market. Diaz was tried and convicted, found guilty of the murder of Javier Angel and attempted murder of yet another child just a week before. Published reports said the motive was extortion. Diaz was sentenced to 25 years to life. I really think that given the violent nature of it, honestly, I don't think she should be alive. For years, Magana fought, going to each of Diaz's parole hearings, arguing against her release. Finally, in 2011, a victory. For the first time in the history of California, the parole board set Diaz's next parole hearing in 15 years instead of five. Now, Julia Diaz, who's in her late 50s, has been denied parole. She will spend the rest of her life behind bars in a woman's prison just outside of Fresno. And Yolanda's brother's story will be told this weekend on Investigations Discovery Channel, Friday night at 10, Saturday at 1 a.m., and again Sunday at 3 p.m. In Santa Barbara, Sharon Roger, News Channel 3. Sharon hey. <laughs> Roger is with us live in our studios. So, um, why, how did you choose this particular story over the many that you've done? Um, you know, I think one of the great joys of this uh, profession is that every day is a new story. Every day you get to meet new people. Every day you get to learn new things. Um, this story touched me personally. So it was hard because, you know, as a reporter, you have to stay objective and um, make sure that you just tell the story. And, and especially when it comes to stories like this, I wanted to make sure that you're not only just sensationalizing a story, but giving that person justice, giving, you know, the little boy that died justice. And for me, it just moved me. So I felt a connection to it. Um, and felt compelled to just submit it. I had no idea I was going to get chosen, so. Well, when you're not doing the news, right. okay, what kind of fun are you doing? What are you having? What, what are you doing in Santa Barbara? When? I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> well, how often are you uh, working? How okay, so it's Monday through Friday, um, but you know, I get up at 3 a.m. It's not so, all luxurious. So no, no, it's uh, definitely the glamour part is maybe 40% and then 60% is, uh, it's not glamorous. But you know, I wake up at 3 a.m. I'm usually at work at 3.30, sometimes even earlier. And I prep for the show, I write, I help the producers stack the show and we get ready for the 5 a.m. newscast. 5 to 7 a.m. is the show. And then we go into Good Morning America segments. And then we go into the morning meeting and sometimes then I'm sent out to do reports, which I then put together for the evening news. So I would say my day kind of wraps up around 1 or 2 p.m., sometimes a little later, depending on what I'm working on. And um, I try to get a nap in. So I would say what I love about the, this shift now, working the mornings, is I used to work the evening shift when I first came to Santa Barbara. I was the evening anchor. I anchored the 5 and 6 o'clock, and then I reported live for the 11 o'clock news. But the morning is a completely different dynamic, and it allows for me to have my evenings free. So I'm a foodie, and I love checking out restaurants. So I've lived here for almost three years now, and there are still places I'm discovering, places that I've never been to. And so that's kind of what I love to do. I love getting together with friends, going to restaurants, trying out new things. I love not live music. So if there's ever a chance to go to the Santa Barbara Bowl or go to, you know, see a performer but I live. I also heard that you enjoy going to Hollywood and Las Vegas when you're not I do, working. I do. Um, Hollywood and Las Vegas. I, I, Las Vegas, not as often as mm -hmm. I, I would want to, but sure, sure. I, I love going with like friends and family. Um, and then in Hollywood, it's kind of, you know, being here in Santa Barbara, I'm so close to home and most of my friends are in Los Angeles. However, I've great, created a great group of friends here as well. So sure, if we're but in LA, we, we go out. Was it hard for you to come from LA to the lifestyle of Santa Barbara? No. I mean, do you consider yourself a Santa Barbara? What? Or do you consider yourself a Santa Barbara? I do, I do. I, I consider this home for me now. And it's, um, a lot of people ask me, is this too slow for you? Is this kind of sleepy for you coming from an uh, LA lifestyle, big energy? Um, and for me, it's perfect because I work, you know, 12 hour days. So I don't miss the traffic of Los Angeles. And I get to kind of enjoy because I live by the beach. So I get to enjoy the serenity of the water. And then I, there's so many great things to do here again, like that I haven't done yet. So I, for me, it's been great. And I have the pleasure of or, or the convenience of going back and forth a lot. Well, what about the stories that you do? Do you prefer the softer pieces or do you prefer like the hard murder stories? Um, I think I, I, I prefer a combination. Um, I think entertainment news is uh, a lot of fun. I've had the 
privilege of covering the Santa Barbara International Film Festival here. It's probably one of my favorite things to cover. Um, it's obviously that's the fun part. You get to you know rub elbows with the celebrities and meet some amazing people that come in town here. Um, but I think what's also very compelling to me are those hard pieces, um, the stories that matter, the stories that. Um, the human interest stories. Um, so I like sit-down interviews, actually. Those are probably my favorite. Um, to actually really get to know somebody a little bit more intimately, I think those are my favorite. Well, you had an intimate meeting with Oprah Winfrey. And mind you, she doesn't give interviews, doesn't right. give very many. And you <laughs> snagged it. I heard that right. your KYT was the only one really there that was allowed there. Right. You snagged it and you got it and you brought a clip from that. I Describe did. that day for us. Um, I think to sum it up, it was probably the highlight of my career. Um, I grew up watching Oprah. She's obviously, to so many millions of people, just an inspiration, someone I've looked up to. I've watched her interview thousands of people, so I had some nerves, you know, because when I was going to meet her, I was going to be on the other side of that interview. And, you know, I think for me, the takeaway was that I grew up watching Oprah, and she was such a loving, such a warm person when I would watch her in my home, and she was exactly that same person in that interview. Um, so it was, just, it was just so amazing to okay. be that close to her. Shireen Rajay, let's watch her with <laughs> Oprah. Oprah Winfrey raised about $600,000 at her auction over the weekend. Shireen Rajay was there for all the action. I have 15 bid 1,600, 15 bid 16. First time auctioneer Oprah Winfrey was on fire. Going once, going twice. The talk show queen had the crowd out of their seats, snapping photos. Even best friend Gail King was there to support. Oprah auctioned off a few items, including a 1985 color purple poster. She even signed it for the lucky new owner, who dished out a nice $4,100. Hundreds of Oprah's personal belongings from her homes in Santa Barbara, Indiana, Maui, and Chicago were up for grabs. Everything from fine art to antiques. As Miss Winfrey renovates her Montecito estate, she says the Oprah style has changed. When I first came to Santa Barbara and I found that beautiful estate there, I thought you had to do like a big fancy, you know, estate looking house with, you know, 18th century and 19th century gold gilded stuff. That really isn't who I am. When I really moved here, and was spending more time here, I realized I really am a pajama girl. This set of six 18th century Louis XVI chairs went for a whopping $60,000. The electric scooters, around $2,500 each. I'm still trying to get that Vogue poster. I'm, I'm going to try to bid on it. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> you know what? I'm, I may want to keep that poster. <laughs> That's what we were talking about. I, right? know, I thought I'd keep that poster. <laughs> and she did. Oprah had a change of heart and ended up keeping this beautiful 1998 Vogue cover. But this yard sale of the century, as many called it, has a bigger vision. In 2007, she founded the Oprah Winfrey Leadership Academy for disadvantaged girls in South Africa. I have 370 girls at the school. I have 74, 75 girls graduating every year. All of those girls go to college. All proceeds of the auction will be donated to the foundation, but college tuition for 74 girls can even be much for Oprah. Anybody who's ever put one through college, you know what I'm talking about. You know why I'm selling the sofas. Okay. Now, the auction raised nearly $600,000. Again, that money will be going towards Oprah's Leadership Academy Foundation, and her Montecito home should be renovated just in time for her 60th birthday bash in January. In Santa Barbara, Sharon Roger, News Channel 3. Very good. Sharon Roger, everybody. <laughs> This could have been winning a golden mic. That was just amazing for me. Whether it won or not, that was for me. Well, yeah. one of our guests previously, John Palminteri, yes, came here with one of these golden mics. John they, Palminteri they don't just is hand them out. So a great friend on, of mine. You're in good company yes, with John Palminteri. Yes. <laughs> John Palminteri has kind of been a mentor, kind of the Rolodex, the mayor of Santa Barbara, I would say. So he's been kind of helping me navigate through the city. Took you under his wings. He Definitely. knows everything about Santa Barbara. Oh yeah. Yeah, I can call John at any hour. He probably is already on the scene, actually. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Now, you mentioned your background. Uh, you speak Farsi. Also heard that you're a fantastic singer. So, and I also know the New Year's coming up. And you, you're a fantastic cook. I've done my research. Wow. Okay. <laughs> you love making big platters of Persian food? I do. 
How do you get invited to these? I do. Yeah, you know. Um, tell us about the New Year and things. Yeah, so yeah, my Persian culture obviously very family oriented. We do throw big parties, and it's all about food. So we have you bring huge platters. <laughs> <laughs> my mom does, right? Um, no, but it, we have big platters of food, and you know, hopefully you'll come on an empty stomach. And so next time, I'll, de I'll definitely invite uh. you, Ken. Um, but yeah, it's exciting actually. Persian New Year's coming up, so we are exactly ten days from Persian New Year. Persian New Year starts right at the beginning of spring. Um, and it hits right at the uh, spring equinox, the vernal equinox. So every year it's a different time, depending on when that equinox happens. So it's not like American New Year that happens at midnight on December 31st. Um, so ours this year is March 20th at 9.57 a.m. So that's kind of when all the families get together and they gather around what's called a half scene. And it's seven things on this table. It's a beautiful spread. Seven things on this table that start with S, and each of these items are symbolic for the new year. You know, kind of uh, a way to bring health or beauty or prosperity or wealth for, for the new year for you. It's actually, the new year is called No Ruz, which means new day. So it's exciting. And Where did you learn to cook? Uh, my mom, but I am definitely nowhere close to my mom's cooking. So I kind of just little recipes here and there. And also with the schedule now, I don't get to cook as often as I'd like, but yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, the the news that got away from you, in mm -hmm. other words, any stories that you just said to yourself, oh my God, I wish I covered that mm -hmm. and I didn't get it. Yeah. Any of those that happen? Usually John Palminteri is covering. <laughs> <He takes> <laughs> Um, yeah, you know, there's still so many stories that I want to cover. Um, Tell us, what are some stories that you'd like to do? You know, Maybe John's listening. Right, I know. Um, He'll stay away from those. There are a lot of <laughs> stories, obviously, would love to cover more election-like stories. So John and I actually would do a lot of the election nights here. Um, maybe get a little bit more into politics, maybe get into a little bit more of the international, national scene. We cover national and international news here locally, but of course our focus is on local news. So even kind of delving a little bit more deeper in some of the bigger issues that we have, you know. Well, so. being a woman in this business and being an anchor mm. has, and I know KYT in the past has had an anchor like suing KYT on looks and mm. versus their, their work. Um, did you, did you have felt any of that coming through um, the ranks? You know, uh, as a woman, surprisingly, no, not yet, at least. Um, I, well, think, I think she's very attractive, don't oh, you, everybody? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're not gonna have a problem with that, trust me. Thank you. You know, but, I, I will say though, it's kind of what I have noticed is it's kind of a cutthroat industry. You know, so whether, especially I think for women. Um, I was very fortunate and so grateful um, that AKEYT brought me on and they are a wonderful group to work with, but also the community of Santa Barbara. I mean, because it's one of those things, they may not like you. So I was so warmly embraced here and I, I host a lot of community of functions in town here and I get invited to, and I love doing that. I love being in the community, but really it's the people that kind of invited me into their homes, write me emails, send me messages on social networking, kind of just welcoming me. And I think that's been so wonderful. But at the same time, as a woman, you're going to get a lot of eyes on you. It's a very competitive. A lot of people want to be in this industry. So you kind of have to, you know, be able to work with the politics that go along with that too. Is there a lot of politics here in Santa Barbara, um, particularly? I would say, you know, for you, I think in, in any industry, you're, you're going to have some politics. So I wouldn't say specifically, I've been targeted, but I would say sure. I would say everybody probably has dealt with some degree of it. Okay, so I know I'm kind of jumping around a little bit, but I was told you're a singer, that you have a great voice. <laughs> um, now, I'm, well, can I embarrass you and ask you, can, can you sing a few, something absolutely Farsi? Absolutely not. There's no <laughs> way? Come on, not. don't you want to hear some Farsi? No, Anybody? no, no. It's something, I, just a little I, I bit? Honestly, just, I, I cannot. I can't do can, it. No. Uh, Maybe I'm the next time you bring me on the show. If you bring me back, I will do that. You know, singing actually was something I loved to do. When I was a kid, my brother mm -hmm. and I would jam. That My brother plays the piano. I actually play the piano, too. And we would sit in our studio in my parents' house, and I would sing, and he would kind of make beats and stuff. So actually, um, at one point in my life, I wanted to be a we'll singer. We'll catch on another time yes. on that one. But your parents <laughs> must be so proud. They have... Your brother's a physician, yes. and here you are as an anchor 
uh, on a very large market Thank place. You. They must be very proud of you. Thank you. You know, I'm so close to my family, and um, I go back to Woodland Hills a lot and to visit them. And my brother, yes, he started his uh, residency at Cedar Sinai. Him and I are very close. So I think for me, family is so important. And I think uh, you know, my dad comes and supports me a lot, and so does my mom. And I think that's something that I want to carry forward in my life as and well. Before we go, I know that you also had the brief interview with Leonardo DiCaprio. Oh. Compare that just for you've got about. 50 seconds, okay. compare that with the Oprah interview. What was it like meeting him? Totally different emotions. <laughs> so, you know, obviously Leonardo DiCaprio, I think was a heartthrob of mine growing up. Um, and just seeing his presence when he came out of that car and the 5,000 people that were waiting there at the Arlington Theater, he has a presence that I haven't seen in a while because I've interviewed a lot of celebrities. And he was so charismatic and so professional with the interview that I was very impressed. Well, we've been very impressed with this half hour Thank with you. you. Thank it's you, It's so, such a delight to have you. So good to see you. And the time went Hope by Hope to be quickly. back. Yeah, I know. We have so much more to talk about. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I want to know what the, what's more on the recipe yes, for this feast. Next time. That, next You'll time. be invited and for we'll sure. And we'll get you to Sing. Yes. Okay. okay. We'll work on that. All right. Glad to have you <laughs> Thank here. Thank you so much. Well, that's it for another edition of Ken Boxer Live. Now, be sure to stay tuned for some of our upcoming shows, which will include figure skater Ty Babylonia, actors Alan Thicke, Lost in Space star Bill Moomy, and actress Meryl Hemingway. Also, remember to catch us on the web at KenBoxerLive.com. All right. Now for my guest, Sharin Roger. And for my director, Nick Ferretti, and for my entire production crew, I'm Ken Boxer saying we'll see you next week on Ken Boxer Live. Good night, everybody. <laughs>